I understand why our, our dear brothers, Judah, don't have a understanding and faith of the Messiah because it's been so distorted. Had they been presented, you know, a man called Yeshua who keeps the Torah, who came as an example to show us how to do it, you know, to kind of point back to all of the instructions that that he gave us at the beginning, that person, they probably would have been able to follow. Welcome to Season 2 of Walk Like a Hebrew. I'm Jody O'Dell. This podcast was created to tell the stories of believers in the Messiah Yeshua, also known as Jesus, who have discovered the truth of the whole Bible and its application to our lives. We talk about how we got from there, whatever our walk of faith looked like, to here, and what exactly it means to walk out our faith like the most famous Hebrew in history, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. This is episode 21, an interview with David and Krista Hooven of Northern Arkansas. We had some technical difficulties and had to record our interview on a less than optimal platform. So please bear with the poor audio quality. I talk with the Hoovens about their marriage story, the problems they had with the Adventist church, and how they discovered God's name, and how their faith journey parallels the story of the Hebrew people's escape from Egypt. This podcast is entirely listener supported. If you're enjoying these testimonies and you would like to make a one-time or recurring donation, please visit sheholdsforth.com slash donate. And now you can also support us through Pod Hero, a $5.99 monthly subscription service that makes it easy to support your favorite podcasts. Check it out at podhero.com. Welcome to Walk Like a Hebrew. My guests tonight are David and Krista Hooven, who currently live in the Ozark Mountains, sometimes in uh, northern Arkansas and sometimes elsewhere, right? How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. Doing very well. Well, thank you for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. So the purpose of Walk Like a Hebrew is to talk to people about how their life was before they came into a life of Torah, and then what was the thing that caused them to rethink their faith. So... Can you guys real quick just tell me about yourselves? Well, uh, like you said, we're uh, David and Krista Hooven, and we have four kids. Um, One is an adult that David adopted when we first got married, and then we had three other ones, boom, 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 and uh, they're uh, Kira and Caden and Danea and David Avery. He currently lives in the bus. And we've bought some property over in Arkansas and are getting ready to build a cabin. Nice. Are you going to be off off grid? That is the plan. Yeah, yeah as much as possible, you know, as the father leads. Sounds like fun. Thank What's you. your faith background? What did you guys did you attend like a mainstream church? Were you Seventh Day Adventist? Where did you come from? Krista grew up Seventh Day Adventist. Um, me personally, I had uh, somewhat of a Christian background as a child, but walked away from faith and then came back into it about 15 years ago. And I was going to a mainstream Christianity church there in Sacramento, Calvary Christian Center. Yeah. I was part of the Overcomers Discipleship Ministries. And then um, a friend of mine shared with me the Sabbath. And then I became a Seventh-day Adventist uh, shortly after that and um, ended up moving to Tennessee where I met my beautiful wife. Yeah, I was bred, born, and raised in the Adventist faith and went to the academy, the boarding academy through high school and beyond and, you know, really lived the faith um, until I got into my 20s. And then I really started questioning life for myself. Kind of walked away as I was figuring things out, went into the world. You know, I was there for about 10 years. But because I really hadn't come across anything more than the Adventist faith, then that's kind of where I gravitated back to. Then, you know, I had my oldest, Kira, during that 10-year period. And, you know, when you have kids, you start to reevaluate life. And I was like, well, you know, I don't want to be raising her kind of where I'm at in my life now. So I kind of started going back to church. And at that time, I was going through a divorce. And I, you know, had just really prayed about, 
you know, who the father really wanted in my life as, you know, a husband. So I just kind of watched and observed and I watched and observed David. (laughs) Anyways, long story short, um, we ended up dating and, and getting married. And as soon as we got married, the father began working. He really began working. And it's interesting how you kind of look back to, you know, him moving in your life. But I mean, we can totally see it now. But as, as David said, you know, we had met in the Adventist church. And for myself, I understood that they kept the Sabbath and they, they kept the health law, eating biblically clean and all. But there was a couple of things that never set well with me. One was, you know, if they kept the Sabbath, well, then why don't we keep the feast? And no matter what explanation they tried to give, it never, ever set well with me. They just couldn't give me the right explanation to satisfy that. When I learned about the Sabbath, when I learned about biblical eating and all that, I was like, why have I never been told this? What I didn't realize is I had the foundation from the Bible story books when I was a child. My mom read those books to us. I didn't realize there was an Adventist book company that put those out. Looking back on it, it was a leading from my childhood, even though I walked away from the faith and, and all of that. Well, while I was there in Sacramento, I met my buddy, uh, Lee Gugliato. It was interesting how all of it played out because we started studying with him again, and he had, at this time, moved to Reno. And he invited us to come out to Reno. We knew that we couldn't stay where we were. So when we got this invitation to go to Reno, we really prayed about it. And we really felt like the father was calling us out that way. Why do we know? (laughs) We had no idea where we were going. So we we ended up going to Reno and being part of that ministry. And essentially what Lee was teaching us was how to study scripture for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, most of us who've come from the Christian background have learned to either sit and listen to a preacher or a teacher or some kind of quarterly, but just really haven't been given the tools to open your word and to really get me out of it without using someone else. And so he really taught us how to do that. And then he was also teaching us how the church or the system, how they've kind of changed the way we worship, how we kind of do things a little bit backwards from scripture. And so for me, that was a little difficult because I was raised in this system. Um, I ended up doing a a Bible study about manna and essentially, you know, that, you know, we're supposed to be in communication with the Father through prayer and through his word six days a week. And that on the sixth day, you know, we're supposed to be getting a double portion. But on the seventh day, that we shouldn't be expecting to be blessed. If anything, we should be kind of giving back to the Father. And so that kind of really helped me in what he was trying to teach that, okay, I can kind of see where I haven't really necessarily been doing it the right way, kind of being in a Christian church. We've always had this mentality that, you know, we're going to go to church and we're going to get the word for the week. It's going to sustain us throughout the whole week. And yeah. then, um, you know, we'll go back to church the next week. You'll go get your little infusion. Yeah. Yes, better charge the batteries. Yeah. And so the father was showing me that that's backwards, that we should be getting infused throughout the week. And then we should be sharing, you know, and praising the father on the Sabbath for what he's been showing us through the week. It was really to prepare me for what he was getting ready to do, because he was getting ready to change our view completely. Just to give a little bit more detail, the study that she was doing, um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it, but for, for those who might be listening, the scripture says you're supposed to gather manna for six days, and on the sixth day, grab a double portion. And then on the Sabbath day, there would be no manna. They went out to find it, and it wasn't there. That was what really sunk it for her, that it was not there. They could not go out and gather on the Sabbath day. So you're not supposed to gather the word, the bread of life, on the Sabbath day. And that, that when that hit her, she was like, whoa, wait a minute. We're doing something wrong. What happened next was just pretty downright amazing, actually. It didn't mean not to gather anything. Like, you're not supposed to open your word. You no, know, you're not, you're not supposed to connect with him. It just means that you're not supposed to expect to get this grand message from him if you haven't been connecting with him throughout the week. Essentially, it's right. like going over the tour portion all week. And then talking about it on Shabbat. Right. That's what what we've kind of gathered it to now. Yeah, yeah. 
But anyways, when we were studying scripture for ourselves, uh, the Father really opened our eyes. We, right then and there, not only came into his feet, but we came into his name. Actually, we went to a Pesach first. Right after Pesach, we came across his name. Just in our own studies, not through Lee, just in what we were studying. The weird part is, at this point, you know, he had taught us how to start a home church. And so we had started our own little home you know, fellowship. Bible fellowship. Mm-hmm. We had a few people coming. And we were teaching them these things that we were learning, that we had been learning and sharing where the Father had been taking us. And one night, as we were studying together, we came across his name. It's like, what is this? Wait a minute. He had the name? <laughs> we, had, we had to hit the brakes. What's going on here? How come we've never heard his name before? So we started researching into it. So it was coming up for our next study. Actually, it was with one lady. And I was going over to her house to study, to kind of go over things, because Krista wasn't able to come that night. And so I was like, okay, Father, how am I going to introduce this to her? And he said, what's in a name? That was his words to me. What's in a name? So that was the question that popped in my head. So I asked her, what's in the name? And her jaw dropped. She (laughs) had come across the name. Oh, my gosh. In her studies. So that was our big aha moment that really kind of kicked everything into action. And then, you know, here he comes and he brings us the feast, which was something that I had always questioned. And everything, like all the dots just started adding up. We finally found what was missing. And so we're sitting here, you know, trying to figure out where to go from here. And we had introduced it to the guy that we had been learning from. Who's a Hebrew scholar. Who's a Hebrew scholar. But that was just kind of not where his ministry was going. So he... I guess just didn't want to hear that for right now. So we felt like that this is where the father was taking us. We started looking online. We were trying to find a fellowship, couldn't find a fellowship in the area. And so for we, two for two years, so we just we kind of, ourselves. we um, gleaned that from in Reno? the internet. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yep. Wow. Yep. Yeah. We were gleaning from, from different teachers that we had come across. So we knew there were other people out there. We thought that we were the only ones in our area. And she'd been looking. She'd been looking online. I'm a big researcher, so I, you know, try to research everything. And I couldn't research, you know, a fellowship that wasn't like, what, 30 minutes away from our house. (laughs) No, the the father kept our eyes closed to that because I really think that he wanted us to um, learn what he wanted us to learn. Because it's interesting because there's like so many different Torah teachers out there, but there are still so many Torah teachers that we haven't even listened to. And I think the father just had a particular teaching, you know, whatever it was, just come across our path so that we could take that in and absorb that just to give us a really good foundation. Because we never really, never really stuck with any one particular teacher. We just felt like that's not where the father was taking us at that time. I think that happens to most of us. And that that period of sort of isolation is Mm -hmm. a lot like what Paul went through after the Damascus Road experience. He didn't go right out and jump into fellowship. He went away and he hid and he studied for a couple (laughs) of years. Well, for us, it wasn't voluntary, I tell you that, because we are such social butterflies that being by ourselves for that two years was hard. It was so, so hard. We just, we wanted people to fellowship, but we couldn't fellowship with the old because they weren't where we were at. We hadn't found anybody of the new yet. So he just had us where he wanted us. Before all of this came down, like right before all this came down, we tried going to another Adventist church. We did. We were there, and it's like, oh, this is wrong. After that two-year period where we were on our own and we were really searching, I just all of a sudden did a search again online for a Hebrew Roots Messianic Fellowship, and then that's when Marty and Terry's fellowship popped up. I was like, wait, here's one. So we ended up calling them, and they were like, okay, here's what we believe. You know, I don't know kind of where you're at in your walk. And so they're kind of naming off, boom, 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 boom. It was like a checklist. Huh? Yeah, a checklist. And it's like, yeah, we believe that now, too, you know, because from our, our <laughs> learning. And yeah, we believe that, too. And we believe that, too. And so it was really awesome because all of these things that the Father was showing us through these two years, we finally found a fellowship that now kind of fits what he had been teaching. 
That's amazing. So we, we started going to that fellowship, and it was a just a wonderful, wonderful fellowship. We were there with them for... Four years? Four years, I believe. And then we knew that the Father was calling us further. There we go again. But it's interesting because our journey to this Torah walk is very much parallel to the Hebrews in the desert, um, in the desert as they were coming out of Egypt. Well, the exodus from Egypt, being in Egypt, the exodus, in the, going to the mountain to to get the laws to all the way to the promised land. It's because our backs were up against the Red Sea in Tennessee. Yeah. We were coming out of the church. We had no place to go but to Reno, to the desert. He took us to the <laughs> desert. The desert. To learn to Torah. The wilderness. <laughs> right. Wow. So he, t- he took us to the foot of Mount Sinai in the desert, taught us Torah. And now here we are crossing the Jordan, becoming Hebrews, which I know that's one of your questions is, what do we call ourselves? Yeah. It's, it's, we call ourselves Hebrews because awesome. it means crossed over. So here it we are does. crossing the Jordan into what we are hoping to be a, a small promised land before the ultimate promised land. So here we are out in the Ozarks now, which apparently <laughs> is a safe haven for messianics. We didn't realize there was thousands of people out here until we got here. So while we were there in, in Reno, um, getting back to the feast, we ended up going to our first Sukkot. We spent with a family. It was just us and the other family, and they just kind of blew our mind. Yeah. Blew our mind wide open to everything. Kind of with my other issue that I was struggling with, with the replacement theology in the Adventist Church, kind of right around the same time that we started to understand and really get into the thief, the Father was also showing us the, the two houses. And that was a really, really, really eye-opening study. I had read Batya Wooten's The Feast of Israel book, and I was starting to kind of, you know, read, you know, about Judah and about Israel or, or Ephraim. I opened up the Word, and I went from beginning to end, looked for anything that either mentioned or referenced Israel and Ephraim. And it really gave me answers that it's not just the Jews who are going to be saved, and it's not just the Christian, it's neither or both, that we're both going to have the testimony of Yeshua and be able to understand and keep Torah. Right. I understand why our, our dear brothers, Judah, don't have a understanding and faith of the Messiah because it's been so distorted. Had they been presented, a, you know, a man called Yeshua who keeps the Torah, who came as an example to show us how to do it, to kind of point back to all of the instructions that that he gave us at the beginning, that person, they probably would have been able to follow. But what they have been shown as a man who most times is depicted as a Caucasian man who, you know, doesn't keep the instructions that he set forth, that man they can't really jive with. At the same time, I don't think they could have at the time because of all the man-made laws, their traditions that they had set for. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think everything had to happen just like it did. And that could be the next great awakening, our brother Judah waking up. That's what we all pray for, peace of Jerusalem. Uh, Peace is only going to be through the Prince of Peace. Who are your favorite resources? Oh, right now my favorite teacher is James Gillespie. James Gillespie. Awaken to Torah Ministries. Awaken um, to Torah. He taught me about the deity of Yeshua. That there is no doubt whatsoever that he was right. that he's fully God. We've gleaned from so many, so many different teachers, but we've yeah. really never focused on any one. I mean, we really, I would say probably of all of the teachers that we've come across, of course, Brad Scott is just a really, really big one. And a lot of 119 Ministries. Their videos um, have been really, really phenomenal. So more of ours is more of like study material than it is really teachers. Um, the Jeff Brenner Ancient Hebrew Lexicon. Okay. Uh, the scriptures, obviously. Hebrew for Christians was another one. We learned how to count to three from uh, Michael Rood. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that was, that was yeah. a big one for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me too. And we learned some stuff from, uh, like we said, from uh, Paul Neeson, Teddy Wilson, 
he he was the one who turned me on to the ancient Hebrew lexicon, how to go back okay. to the, the ancient Hebrew and learn the pictographs and really kind of pick apart scripture and put it back together in such a way that you can actually see it through the Hebrew mindset. But yeah, there's just been so many. We've learned from, from all kinds of people on all different subjects, you know. Um, That's one of the things I love the most about this walk. You don't have to be sorted into churches based on the one person that you like to listen to the most. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very, very much we glean from a great many different teachers. With this walk compared to uh, mainstream Christianity, you know, that has different doctrines set forth for, you know, the different religions, we only have the Bible. You know, as we're coming out of different backgrounds, different faiths, different views, we all have the same goal to have a deep relationship with Yahweh. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I feel in this walk is that there's such more of a feeling of community because there's so many more people on the same page. At least in the same book. Yeah, in the same book. Maybe different versions, but the same book. Yes, we have different viewpoints on scripture. Some are minute and some are extreme. You know, you're going to always have that because we are human and we do have perceptions, particularly from how we've been brought up and raised and what we've been in in the past. But mm -hmm. if we are careful and we allow the Father to lead, then we're all going to end up at the same place. You know, this walk, we, like Krista said, we have we have some divisions. We have all kinds of different theories that are, are kind of putting splinters in there, if you will. But we need to get rid of that stuff. We need to all come together under Yeshua and study Scripture. That's one thing I love about this is it's the Bible and all of the Bible. Not just one here, one part there, but it's line upon line, precept upon precept, just like what, what Scripture says we're supposed to do. And it's it's been the, the core foundation of, of our walk after learning how to study the Bible is exactly what we did, keeping everything in context. Mm -hmm. And part of that context is, is knowing who wrote it, what they were thinking, how they were thinking, what was going on at the time, the culture at the time. You, you have to put all that into account and then apply it to your life. Not apply it to your life and then try to figure out, you know, other stuff later. No, you have to, you have to get down to the, to the root of it. It makes That's, a big difference. Makes a huge difference. Makes a huge difference. There's our three sources. That work for you? There's your three sources. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything else that you'd like to add that you think that people should know? Don't get stuck. Don't get stuck in what you think you know because you, you don't know what you don't know. So don't dwell on what you think you know because there's always somebody who knows more. That's a good one. That's a really good one. I have a saying that I I love. I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but at least I'm not where I was. We should constantly be growing in his word. We should constantly be changing, you know, in our seeking. I mean, the only thing that we will have of our own when we enter his kingdom is our character. Everything else will be new. And if we are not speaking his word, looking for change in our character to be more like his, it may not be what he is looking for. You know, he wants a character that's going to be worthy of his kingdom, particularly in today's time with all of this nonsense that's going on. There's so many people out there right now that are in such fear, are so angry. I mean, yes, we're frustrated at, you know, just what's going on. But we have a promise in a father. Our fear should be in him only, nothing else. If we cling to him and know that he's going to provide everything that we need and even some of our wants, that's all that matters. 365 times it says, do not fear. That's once for every day. Do not fear. Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> and sister, I know what you've been going through. Others might not know, but do not fear. He's got this. We're not, we're not supposed to, how does the scripture say? We're not supposed to have a spirit of fear? Yep, do not have a spirit of fear. I don't remember the rest. That's all I can remember. I don't remember. <laughs> I know, I, I, that's, that's the part that sticks out to me. <laughs> that's the part that I remember. Do not have a spirit of fear. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you so welcome. much for taking the time to sit down and tell me your story. I really appreciate yeah. it. 
Thank you for listening to Walk Like a Hebrew. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Walk Like a Hebrew. And don't forget to share this podcast with friends and family. Many thanks to Jack Lane for the music. To get a free copy of his CD, Lord I Lift Your Name, send an email to jacklane at earthlink.net. May Yahovah bless you. We'll catch you next time.